Engineering and Marketing Manager for the Bridge Grid Flooring Manufacturers Association. Phil received his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Toledo. Prior to joining DS Brown, Phil was involved in the inspection, design, and analysis of bridge structures for engineering design firms in the Toledo area, and was also a combat engineer in the U.S. Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. Okay, thank you. Rehabilitation is preservation, and bridge deck replacement is preservation, okay? So in many cases, a deck replacement can ex extend the life of a bridge and save significant future costs. And per FHWA, uh, projects typically, these kind of projects typically require significant engineering and a very lengthy completion time, or do they? And that's what we're here to talk about today a little bit. Georgia takes the approach of, there's four different things that the, Georgia does f as far as bridge deck rehabilitation. First thing that they look at is bonded concrete overlays, but they never do this for interstates and they rarely for high volume uh, roadways. <clears throat> hydro demolition and concrete overlay, this is their bread and butter where they hydro demolish, hydro demolish about an inch below the top um, mat of rebar and uh, overlay. And it's kind of dependent on the existing condition because um, if you got a lot of blow throughs then you got um, full depth replacement that you got to, um, that you're doing. Which brings you to the next one, which is a conventional cast in place, re in place, re replacement with uh, high early concrete. This is where they'll take and shift traffic off to the uh, shoulders or the median and um, close the lane for about seven to 10 days and replace the concrete. Then they start looking at prefabricated systems, okay? So that when the costs associated with the impact of traffic, those, uh, um, those costs that Tom Smith was earlier talking about, um, when they outweigh the material costs, because these systems are a little bit more expensive than standard replacement costs. But why, why would you want to specify grid reinforced concrete decks? Well, this, <coughs> they've been around for a long time. Number one, they've been, for, they've been around for a really long time. Um, we'll show later on, well, down below there, um, we've got some examples of some systems that have been around for quite some time. Uh, they have a high strength to weight ratio, and they're, uh, prior to the ABC revolution, what, before that became a sexy term, these, things, these grid deck technologies have been around. So um, they're, they're good at speed of installation too. Uh, a little bit more about durability and longevity. There's a lot of decks that have been out there that are well over 50 years old. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the South 10th Street Bridge, but that deck was installed in 1932, and it's still, it's still in, in good condition. It's now 85 years old. The Walt Whitman Bridge was recently replaced, but not before it had uh, given 50 years of service. But the grid deck that was on that bridge was not in bad condition. Um, they needed to lighten the load because the... Uh, the cables for the suspension bridge were uh, experiencing some uh, stress, and so they needed to lighten the load, so they replaced it with a lighter weight uh, grid deck. Uh, the Mackinac Bridge was installed back in 1957, those exterior lanes. The, in, the, in, the inside lanes are an open grid because uh, um, uh, D.B. Steinman design were um, to allow updraft through there. Um, but the outside lanes are a four and a quarter inch fill grid system with an asphalt overlay and they've been going on and they're still in really good shape too. Um, and the Homestead Graves High Level Bridge is one example that uh, we talk about where this system has been in place and has outlived uh, two standard reinforced concrete deck systems in the approach spans. And that's not uncommon. So in addition to longevity and durability, uh, other reasons why you might want to specify a grid reinforced concrete deck is for weight savings, okay? You can save approximately 30 to 50% of the weight from a standard reinforced concrete deck given the same span, uh, the same span situation. And as this little uh, chart shows there, that as the importance of the deck weight increases and as the importance of the speed of construction increases, there, then you start getting into where grid decks are uh, commonly specified. It, we're not saying most, most uh, decks are replaced with standard reinforced concrete decks. So, uh, uh, but as these two factors increase, that's where you start getting into the use of them. 
And simply by uh, putting on a lighter deck, you can possibly increase the live load rating back, maybe back to where it was designed to be. Um, and by using uh, lightweight concrete, you can save some more weight. Speed of construction has gotten a, a lot more popular. Um, primarily uh, FHWA's focus of get in, get out, and stay out. Um, so grid decks have been used for nighttime, weekend, or with some other uh, uh, maintenance and protection of traffic system. Um, and as to going back to what Tom said earlier, you, you got these indirect cost savings too that need to be considered. Here's a little bit more about the South 10th Street Bridge. Uh, like I said, it was uh, constructed in 1932. Um, just recently, uh, uh, it, patches, random patches across the surface of the deck were taken out. I think they were two foot by two foot square patches. Um, they peeled out the concrete and they looked at the steel inside there and just very minor corrosion. So. They patched it back up with concrete, and probably that concrete that they put back in there will deteriorate before the rest of the deck will. The Eads Bridge was the first bridge, the first steel bridge across the Mississippi River back in 18, built in, back in 1874. Um, it was built with uh, rail traffic on the lower sides and um, uh, vehicular traffic, well it wasn't built back then for vehicular traffic, but you know, for a horse and buggy and stuff like that, but I mean, but to bring it up to HS20 load capacity, uh, they needed to reduce the weight of the deck that was on there, and so by doing that, by going with a, an exodermic deck spanning floor beam space at 12 feet, as they took out the floor beams that were spaced at 6 feet, they replaced it with floor beams spaced at 12, and putting an exodermic deck on there, they were able to uh, reduce the weight sufficiently to not have to do any uh, work to the structure. One of the greatest savings that you can see is within, with movable structures. And here's one, here's one uh, shown on the 17th Street Causeway Bridge in Fl uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where the exodermic deck was uh, cast composite with the floor beams and the steel girders which uh, saved weight on the deck, which translates into savings down from the structure to the trunnion down to all the way down to the uh, foundation. Grid decks have been around for a long, long time. Just as mentioned with the South 10th Street Bridge, they were first in, uh, introduced back in the 1930s. Back when they were first introduced, there were several main bar sizes. There were uh, main bars that were two inches tall, three inches tall, four and five inches tall. And um, of, those, of all of those sizes of main bars that were introduced back then, only the four and a quarter inch and five and three sixteenths inch main bar uh, are still around today. But uh, this is the workhorse of the industry. And like I said, this has been around the longest. So it has the highest performance to cost ratio and has a great uh, service record. So back in the 1950s, the engineers started thinking about um, the design of it and how they could save a little bit more weight. And they determined that, well, if we remove the concrete from the lower portion of the grid deck, but that's intention, you can't count it in positive bending. Um, let's, we put a, a flange on the bottom of that main bar and that's a good intention. So the concrete's up on top doing its work. Um, it has similar span capacities to the full depth system and has a great strength to weight ratio. From that partially filled system came an exodermic deck and it first started out with using the same main bar that the uh, partially filled system uses. And then back in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, it transitioned to the main bar as a uh, um, a, w, a standard WT section. Ashto uh, actually defines this as an unfilled steel grid deck composite with a reinforced concrete slab. If they could just say exodermic, that'd be a lot easier. These have the best strength to weight ratio of all. Normally, we'll go into a little bit about the fabrication of each of the panels, but they, when the panels arrive, they basically arrive out to the job site as a galvanized preformed deck. Okay, so here's the ease bridge, 
with the, uh, a panel that's spanning uh, floor beam space at 12 feet. So that's essentially a 36 foot long panel and the width of it is approximately eight and a half feet or eight, eight to eight and a half feet. Where the guy's left foot is standing, that's the floor beam. So when the panels are shot, the, uh, there, there'll be haunch form, excuse me, when the panels are set, they'll, they'll shoot a stud down along the top of the floor beam to make the whole thing composite with each other. And um, there'll be some haunch forms that he has to bring up in there. There's also a form that would be placed between panels where his hands are, but that's the extent of all of the forming that needs to be done. With an exodermic deck system, he'll, they'll lay a mat of rebar, and then they'll go ahead and pour it. And they're using conventional means. Here they're using a uh, vibratory screed, but if it's a full width replacement, they'll, they'll use a bid well as well. It's just, you know, standard replacement. And when it's all said and done, you don't know you're driving on a reinforced concrete deck system or a grid reinforced concrete deck system. So um, it, it looks the same when you're on top of it. A couple of examples is the Matthews Bridge. This is a major artery, um, uh, east-west artery in Jacksonville. Uh, built in 1952 with a main span, has had an open grid deck system on it. Florida DOT wanted to replace that uh, open grid deck system, but they needed to use something lightweight. So they uh, contacted, uh, well, the, the designer contacted us and looked for a solution, and we came up with an ex exodermic deck system. You can see on the picture there where they shifted traffic. They, I think they detoured traffic in one direction, kept one direction of traffic on the bridge. So there you can see where they're driving on the open grid system and they're replacing with an exodermic deck there. The replacement deck weighed just slightly less than 49 pounds per square feet while still maintaining two inches of cover. The project was completed two days ahead of schedule in a 90 day window and they averaged about 40, 400 to 500 square feet per day. Another bridge is the Walt Whitman Bridge. We talked about that earlier, there, where they replaced that deck because the uh, main cables were experiencing some stress. Uh, high ADT of 120,000 vehicles per day. So they replaced, they replaced the deck in seven lane closures, one, one lane each, uh, each time um, in the course of two years. And they called this a floating deck system because they replaced all of the stringers as well and they put a, an elastomeric bearing or a sliding elastomeric bearing between the stringer and the floor beam. Precast construction has become you know, even more popular because of uh, the heightened uh, installation rates. With, uh, with cast in place construction, you can probably get up to about 1,000 square feet per day. But with precast construction, uh, installation rates of over 2,000 square feet per day can be achieved, which is kind of dependent on the size of your project as well, and uh, also how long it takes the contractor to get over the learning curve, of course. But uh, like, you know, as we discussed, though, there's, there's nothing really um, unique about this installation. But we talked to earlier too that we can use stage or phase construction and we can also do weekend or uh, nighttime closures if, uh, if it permits. So the, the precast panels basically start out as you know, just a regular panel. They get galvanized as well. So instead of going out to the job site, they will either go to a precaster's yard or to the contractor's yard where they'll be uh, precast. Panels are set with a pretty robust lifting rig um, to reduce to limit the stresses in the concrete. You don't want to um, we don't want to have any cracked concrete on those panels when they get out to the job site. Most of the time, the fabricators will have leveling bolts already adjusted pretty close to where they need the height of the uh, deck to be already. So that very minimal adjustment can, needs to be taken care of when the, after the panels are set. Here you can see that standard tools, pneumatic tools are used to adjust the height, the location of the leveling bolt up and down.
We would recommend that you have a mobile mixer on site. Last thing you want to do is have uh, high early strength concrete in a truck um, getting, you know, start to harden in the truck after it gets caught in traffic. Um, you need vibrators to get down, uh, make sure that the concrete's being consolidated into the nooks and crannies. And this is what it looks like. So there are, there are um, options that are available to uh, finish this. Um, number one is to grind, diamond grind and seal, say with a methacolate type uh, sealer. Uh, prepare the surface either by uh, shot blasting or uh, water blasting or even profiling and then place an epoxy or a PPC overlay on top of it like we just talked about. Um, or possibly install a waterproofing membrane and an asphalt overlay. I-285 corridor in Atlanta was one of the very first G. Uh, ABC projects um, over the Cobb Parkway and the Buford Highway, which was bridges built back in the 1950s and the 60s. Very high ADT, uh, approaching 300,000 vehicles per day. So it was the ins these bridges were widened on each side, so it was the original interior lanes that needed to be replaced. And the total depth of those uh, slabs were only about six and a half to seven inches. Um, so GDOT specified uh, weekend closures to minimize the interruption to traffic. They, uh, they allowed 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, 5 a.m. on Monday morning uh, closures. They allowed them 16 weeks because I think a lot, this, since this is what was their first one, they really weren't too sure how much time they needed to allot. So they allotted 16 weeks, weekends, and they finished five weekends ahead of schedule. When it was all said and done, the, the decks were replaced at a rate of about 2,300 square feet per, day, uh, per weekend. The Grand Island Bridges is a major, major route to the uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, peak traffic of around 3,000 vehicles per day. Uh, this system, this exodermic deck system, uh, allowed the deck to uh, be rated for an HS25. Um, this is a nighttime closure. They had uh, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. closures, and um, they were achieving 2,000 square feet per night. And you can see some liquidated damages there of $1,000 per minute if they didn't get the bridge open by 6 a.m. or up to $125,000 per day. Um, I think the contractor, when he first got started on this job, had a little bit of trouble, and I think he got beyond that point of no return. He said, ah, the heck with it. We're just going to keep her closed for the whole day. Here's one that's local, uh, just north of Morgantown and just south of the Pennsylvania border. This is a glue lamb arch structure that was built with an FRP deck. And um, WVDOH um, allowed a 30-day calendar window, and um, the contractor replaced the 5,400 square feet of deck in uh, less than 30 days, um, 10 days early, actually. So grid decks have been out there for a long time. So as we're chasing this 100-year bridge, we have technology that has actually shown that it can last getting close to that. I mean, we got grid decks that are in there for 85 years. Um, we want to make sure that there's good communication between uh, the contractor, uh, the fabricator, uh, the owner, and the designer as well to make sure that we're all uh, trying to achieve the same outcome. Make sure that precast panels are being handled carefully. Like I said, we want a robust lifting rig. You want to make sure that the settlement of that uh, uh, rig is taken into consideration too. The durability of the system is affected by the number of cold joints. Um, like I said, we want to make sure that we seal them up with some type of system. Uh, rapid setting concrete is a, uh, you're going to get some compromise between the rapid set and some shrinkage cracking. So it's shown that uh, uh, fibers have helped control that. Um, and you want to make sure that you're specified, I, I know I'm not supposed to be, make this commercial, but you want to make sure that you uh, specify a BGFMA fabricator too because they're, they're going to provide the experience that you need to make sure the job's done right. Okay, so this is the end of the first session. Good job. <laughs>